Welcome to Revival Radio TV. I'm Gene Bailey. Today, we're going to learn more about George Whitfield, the father of our first great American awakening. Let's check it out how it all began. Genesis 26, 18 tells us Isaac dug again the wells of Abraham. In every generation, there have been revivals, massive moves of the Spirit that changed the course of history. In every revival, there were believers like you who chose to answer the call, to become the one in their generation. Discover your call to be the one in your generation. We're about to take you face to face with history. So let's get into today's program. With me again is Doug Bonner. Doug, glad you're here. Good to be here, Gene. Uh, let's talk about someone that a lot of believers here in America may have heard about, may th hear his name thrown around a lot, and that's George Whitfield. And so talk to me about who he is in his story. Well, he was an English man. He was born in the early 1700s, and uh, but he had a, an amazing adventure. Uh, he was an, an evangelist, and he felt prophetically called to the colonies that would become the United States of America. He preached 18,000 um, uh, uh, sermons, gave 12,000 uh, talks over a 30-year period. He crossed the Atlantic Ocean 13 times. He spent three years almost just on boats to preach in the Americas. He spent nine years tirelessly being an evangelist. It is said of him that his life was a, a continual, uninterrupted sermon. He was almost the religious rock star of the day. He was known by over 80% of the inhabitants of the colonies. Wow. 18,000 sermons. Yeah, amazing, huge amount. He just preached almost every day. And isn't that what we're supposed to do is live a life, live our life as a living sermon? Absolutely. What an example George Whitfield gave us. So I want you to watch this brief video and learn more about who George Whitfield really is. In an upper room at Oxford University, a small group of ordinary young men gather in what would be named the Holy Club. Little do they realize that they're about to give birth to a movement that will change the world. Among them are names like John Wesley and George Whitfield. These men will challenge the status quo of the most powerful empire on earth by taking the gospel out of the church building and into the streets and fields of England and America. These sparks will soon engulf the world, known as the First Great Awakening. It will spark the American Revolution and ring the death knell for slavery. All right, let's dig into this, Doug. Tell me about the father of the First Great Awakening. Well, you could say that if Jesus was born in a barn, then George Whitfield was born in a bar. His parents were, were business owners, and he came into this world in, in, in December of 1714. That's 300 mm. years ago. And he had his main, uh, uh, the passion that he had was the theater. He loved uh, to act and, and to tell stories in front of people. He had an amazing voice that carried long distances, and uh, he, was, he was passionate to become really an entertainer. But his family, they took him to church, as the majority of people in those days uh, did, and there was a Godward side to him. As a young boy, he said to his, his, um, his sister, um, he said that God intends something uh, for me which we know not of. Mm. As a teenager, uh, he told his mom once, he was going on an, uh, on an errand, and he said this, he said he received a spiritual Im impression that he would become a minister or a preacher one day. Well, his, his mom just laughed at that because there were two sides to, uh, uh, two sides to George at that time. There was the, the, the spiritual side, and it wasn't good. It was annoying, his mom said, because he was just holier than thou, and he criticized, you know, folk for doing things he felt were ungodly. But then um, there was the George side, and then he would just turn around and do exactly those things. But as he, uh, he, he grew up, um, he wanted to go to Oxford. 
-hmm. and receive an education. But his father had died when he was very young and they had no finances. But his mom, she made a way for him to enter into Oxford under a scholarship where he was basically, a, a, it was called a, a servitor. He was a, a butler to the older students. Little did he know the transformation that would happen in his life when he went to Oxford. So, born in a bar. Yeah, yeah in a bar. Can you believe that? <laughs> born in a bar, called of God, and gets somehow gets from that lowly beginnings to a place of being in Oxford. Now, Oxford still has, what a statement. Now, even today, when you say you went to Oxford, um, it's a tremendous yeah. thing to be able to say. But he also knew, he was also uh, connected with the Wesley brothers somehow. Yes. Tell, tell me about that. And there's a specific story I want you to share about the woman in the drowning incident. It's a great story. He said, I went to Oxford without a single friend. And the first year out um, at Oxford, um, um, it didn't help because all the wealthy students that he was, he, was, he, he was serving were encouraging him, as he said, to join in the excess of riot. So um, <laughs> he was trying to be holy and good and pleasing uh, to God. So he didn't have a good time. Yeah, no, he was. A, but it was the Wesley brothers that I mean, they 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 saved him in the sense that they they uh, and they poured him into their holy club. And now the holy club, he felt at home there because everyone was trying to be holy. And so it was like pray and read your Bible and do good things. But it was one of those things where he had an encounter that he wasn't sure that you even could have. And it was to go and visit those who were in prison and, and poor. So here's, you know, the young 18-year-old George Whitfield. He, he's walking down the streets of Oxford and he comes across a woman who he's met because her husband is in jail, but she's soaked to the skin and she's distraught. And she comes up to him and says, Mr. Whitfield, I'm so sorry, but I didn't have food for my children. This morning, my husband is in, in prison. I felt that my life was worthless, so I've just tried to drown myself. Mm. And, and so she said that she threw herself in the River Charwell, which still runs through Oxford, right. and a man had rescued her. And she, and she was pulled out, and she knew that she'd done a wrong thing, and she, and she instantly said, I'm going to find... Mr. Whitfield, and so she did. She bumped into him. That was a God incident. And she said, can you come and visit my husband and I? So the first thing he did, he gave her, her money and food for the babies. So the next day, he's visiting this man and something happens. He just opens up the Bible and he reads John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, whoever should believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. An amazing thing happens. This woman, all of a sudden, she gets happy. And she says, I believe, I believe. I don't have to, to perish. I can have everlasting life. And George is thinking, well, I've preached this before. I've said this before. Why is she, you know, she's so excited. She actually believed it. Yeah, exactly. But then the husband, I can, I mean, he did the same thing. I can imagine him thinking, well, I believe too. Yeah. Um, but he was amazed because something happened from just the believing of one verse of the Bible. He didn't know that mm. that could happen, but he was about to have that experience. And that experience, it rocked his world. He recalled a ray of divine light which instantly uh, uh, darted upon my soul. And from that moment, but not until then, uh, I did know that I must be a new creature. He said he was filled with joy for hours and for days on end. And he was shocked by the effect that it had on him. But, but not everybody was happy as he was. Yeah, now, Whitfield, he wasn't, in, in, when you look at art of that time and drawings, they never show Whitfield in a church. That's true. There, he's always outside. Yes. And he was always preaching in the fields. And uh, what happened with that? Was he become a traveling minister? Is that what he was doing? Yes. Now, of course, he began, he was preaching in the, the churches, but the doctrine of the Church of England from the, the, the Book of Common uh, uh, Prayer was that you were born again 
um, at the time that you were baptized as an infant. And then he has this experience. He sees that, that the Bible, even though the Book of Common Prayer has got some awesome things in it, it diverges from the scriptures. Right. And so he started to preach that you had to be born again as an adult. He got a whole lot of persecution because there were, were, were people who said, no, that's not the case. So the, the, um, the doors to the churches and the pulpits they closed, and so he had. He was preaching in one church, and he had a thousand people outside, and he realized, wait a minute, I can be more effective outside than inside of the churches. Well, and I think what you just said there is tremendous truth that we all need to take. This just goes right into what we talk about being the one. You can be more effective outside the church than you can be inside because that's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take this gospel to the world yes. and take it to, so he was a living example of what needed to happen. Yes. To yes. Us preaching out and taking the gospel to the world. He truly was the one, being the one, wasn't he? Yes, and there's a great story about that. He was in the, the Bristol area, which is on the west coast of, right. of England. I grew up around that area, and it's a coal mining uh, um, um, area. So he's just walking there, and the shift is obviously ending for a whole bunch of coal miners who are coming out. Now, because they are black, they're covered in the, the coal dust. All you can right. see is the white of their eyes. So he calls over to them, and he said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And they stop, and then he says it again. And they're shocked because why is a minister um, uh, talking outside of the church? Because right. preaching is only supposed to be done inside. Well, he preaches to about 200 of, of these guys. An amazing thing uh, takes place. Um, he's preaching on the darkness of the pit of hell and being separated from God and how Jesus was a friend of publicans and, and sinners. Right. But, I mean, uh, these coal miners were called, you know, uh, um, I mean, they were uh, uh, crude and, and coarse and cussing men. Right. But all of a sudden he saw that tears would pour down their faces and leave white streams. He said it was white gutters on their faces. And he realized that God was touching these unchurched men. Well, he preached for a number of days. Uh, in a few days, there were 2,000, hmm. then five, then 10. And he preached to a crowd of 20,000 people, unheard wow. of in those days. In the years leading up to the American Revolution, one man sowed the seeds of revolution simply by changing men's hearts. This Englishman sparked the embers of revival in England. Then he brought it to America, where the flames swept like a wildfire. His dramatic storyteller sermons drew thousands of followers throughout the colonies from New England to Georgia. Vast seas of crowds who gathered outdoors became converts after hearing him explain about the new birth we can have in Christ. The pulpits of the churches were closed to him, in both England and often in America. Yet he reached into many of these churches, and from the pastor to the parishioner, entire churches were saved and transformed. George Whitfield was responsible for changing the way Americans thought about God, the church, their liberty and equality, and by doing so, transformed a nation and the world. So, so he comes to America, and so what happens when he gets here? Well, he starts to preach. An amazing thing um, happens is that he, he goes to the highways and in byways. On one of his trips, he preached to half a million uh, um, ind individuals. He was tireless, and um, he would have large crowds. Now, it wasn't just the preaching, but he, he met a man called, called Benjamin Franklin because he was the co-signer of um, the, the, uh, the, the Declaration of Independence. But, but Benjamin Franklin, he was a printer. He was a businessman. And he'd heard about this, um, this up and coming um, evangelist in, in England. So they got together and he printed all his sermons. And even when Whitfield was not preaching, his sermons were, uh, they would actually read them in churches and have revivals. So when you went to Whitfield Revival, what was that like? And I specifically want you to tell the story of, of Nathan Cole. Tell me about that. It was electric. 
it was exciting. There was anticipation. Mm. And uh, there's a great story. I mean, businesses shut down, courts shut down, farms shut down, and everyone, they went to the revival. Nathan Cole, he was a young man and um, a rider, almost like a town crier, would go out and say, Whitfield's preaching, Whitfield's preaching. He's preaching at uh, 10 a.m. in the courthouse. And so Nathan dropped what he was doing in the field. It was 8 o'clock in the morning. He'd likely been up since 4 Right. And he ran inside, he gets his, his wife, and they get on a horse and they rush and they drive for a um, whole hour, 12 miles into the, into the town. But it's, but it's so interesting because the horse got tired, he had to rest and uh, walk a bit. But he said, I saw a cloud um, over the town. But as he got closer, it wasn't a, 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 a cloud at all. Uh, of mist, it was a cloud of dust. Mm. There was a traffic jam and hundreds and hundreds of horses and carriages of people rushing in to hear the evangelist. He said um, he had to wait for a gap almost in the traffic to get in. So he gets in there and the anticipation is so high. And he said it was like the voice of an angel who spoke to him. And, um, and, and as with many thousands of, of people, he was touched by that. He said, I look back on the farms and they were empty. Right. The power of the Word of God. He knew how to, how to relay that. But you talked about him spending time on his knees and the Word yeah. and the sermons would jump out at him. Yeah. You know, that's something that we, we live in such a immediate society. And I know we've said this for my whole life, you know, we almost cursed microwaves when they came out because they were too quick. And, um, you know, the, the, there's nothing like getting on your knees and seeing what God has to say oh, to you, yeah. hearing Him. So as he's preaching, um, what, kind of, what kind of messages would he actually preach? He preached on everything. Now, of course, he preached the message I think over 3,000 times, and that was, you must be born again. He said... Let us not use labels uh, and let us say we are just Christians. And I think that he really, he, he unified unintentionally, I think, all these, all these different uh, groups and states un, um, under one, it was, un, it was a nation under God rather than individual states under their, uh, under their denomination. Because like uh, even in Pennsylvania, it was founded by... William Penn, and he was a Quaker. Right. So it's like uh, the flavor was we're Christian first, and it birthed an identity, I think, of, of the whole nation that was to come. So what was the difference between Wesley living to 88 and Whitfield only going to 56? It was not spiritual. It wasn't a God thing that he was called home early. Whitfield, he got what he said. He said, I would, I would rather wear out than rust out. He did not uh, take care of himself. He kept a very punishing uh, schedule. I mean, he, he would sometimes, he would preach all day. He would ride all night and then preach again. Here's just a, a, uh, a nine-day excerpt of, of um um, of his life. It said he visited the sick, the, the imprisoned, he entertained um, um, with guests. He was, in, he was in, in Pennsylvania. He dined with William Penn's heir. He prayed with many individuals. Uh, he was a man, he loved, you know, to go. The, the worst moments of his life was those three years mm -hmm. that he spent on the, on the ships. He said, I faced the devil on those times because he hated when he was not uh, uh, moving around. So yes, he died young. I think if he had looked after himself, he would have, you know, uh, he would have had many more years, but um, he packed a lot of years, you know, um, a lot of life in those years. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Benjamin Franklin was pretty skeptical, wasn't he? Yeah, I mean, I mean, to be honest, I was too. It's like, are you kidding me? I mean, I mean, 30,000 people, how about 300? Right. I mean, um, no microphone and no amplification and all the noise outside. So, so, so it's a great story. Franklin is um, in Pennsylvania. He's listening to Whitfield. And so he's skeptical, but he's the scientist, of course, you know. So he walked away as far as he could from where Whitfield was preaching. 
and he did a calculation. He kind of drew an arc and thought, well, there's the preacher, I'm here. And if I drew an arc, you know, like an auditorium, right? if I give everyone like two foot by two foot, it wasn't 20,000 who could hear. He calculated that 30,000 could mm. hear that man preach. I mean, that changed me. I, I thought, man, that's true. That's not just wow. preaching, you know. That's facts. <laughs> yeah, that's facts. That's right. That's right. Which is great. Uh, how did, you know, Franklin, he was, and, and most of us don't know, didn't know that, I'm sure you, maybe you didn't ever heard that uh, uh, Benjamin Franklin had such an interest in Whitfield and what he was doing. Um, so was Franklin a Christian or what did he believe? Well, he was, uh, um, um, Franklin, he called himself a, a deist. And a deist was a man who believed that God's there, but he doesn't involve himself in the affairs of man. So praying is useless. Mm. So he called him that, but he wasn't really because he believed in prayer. And at the time of the revolution, he encouraged the people to pray and invoke God, invite God into their uh, a, a, a affairs. But so... We don't know if he became a Christian. I remember when uh, Franklin was becoming famous as a scientist because he flew his kite in, into a, right. a thunderstorm. Always remember that, you know, that. And Whitfield, he wrote to him and said, I would now humbly recommend to your diligent, un, un, unprejudiced pursuit and study of the mystery of the new birth. So he's saying, study the new birth. And we don't know that, um, you know, that he became a, a Christian, but he greatly appreciated the, f the fruit of the new birth. Right. I mean, the change. There's a wonderful experience here. This was in 1739, um, uh, and this is Franklin. He said this, it was, it was wonderful to see the, uh, the change that was, in, that was made in the behavior of our inhabitants from being thoughtless or indifferent about religion. It seemed as if the whole world was growing religious so that one could not walk through town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in, in different families. So, man, he loved to see the he fruit of revival. He was, yeah, he was seeing the fruits of the revival. Absolutely, and he believed in it. You know, there, there are several uh, revivals where something happened with a child, did something huge. Yeah, because we think it's just the big evangelist, the, you know, the Great Awakening, but there was many thousands of small. And this, this a, a mother, she was born again, and, uh, and she was trying to share the excitement of that with all her friends, and she may have not been good at it, and she was frustrated because no one wanted to hear her. But her daughter, her 10-year-old daughter, she got saved and just was full of joy and said, Mom, I want to tell the whole world this. Um, pray, let me run to some of the neighbors and tell them that they'd be happy and love my, my Savior too. And so, and, and the mother said, I don't know, I've tried that and it, and it didn't work. But this 10-year-old, she went to a shoemaker and she was quite blunt, she said, you need to be saved, otherwise you're going to be lost and without God. And amazingly, the tears just started to pour down this man's uh, faith. So it's not a great evangelist now, it's a 10-year-old girl, and he was saved. And 50 people were born again just a result of that. So it was more than the great man of God. It was just people just sharing what happened in their lives. Mm. Yeah. What, what about some of his messages with, um, how did the other pastors receive him when he was preaching? Especially when he's talking about the new birth. Yeah. He was the talk of the town and, and, the t and in the taverns too. And um, he was very dramatic. And so they didn't like his style and they didn't like what he said. Again, they struggled over, over this this whole thing of the new birth. I mean, I mean, to us, it's obvious. You start and you get born again. Right. But, 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 but these guys had years of religious life. And so um, he was shut out of the churches, even in the, the colonies often. So it wasn't, was it just the pastors that gave him a hard time? or was Oh, man, no. I mean, there were individuals who would just try and cause uh, uh, problems. There's a great story here. There's a, a, a gentleman, he was called John... Uh, Morant, he was a freed um, African-American. He was, he was a French horn player. Right. So he'd walk past a meeting house 
where Whitfield was, and, and, and there's a lot of noise going on. And he said, what's going on in there? And his friend said, oh, they're just hallooing in there. You know, they're just crazy guys. So this guy said, I'm going to stir up a bit of trouble here. I'm going to go in and blow my French horn. So he pushes his way in. He pulls, off, you know, the French horn off his shoulder, just as if the elderly, um, when the elderly Whitfield looks at him and says, Amos 4.12, prepare to meet thy God, O Israel. This guy is knocked to the ground. Just It's like the power of the word impacted him. And he said, when he got up, he said it was fight. It was like the words of Whitfield were like swords that pierced him, but in a good way. Ah. And he was transformed. There's another great example of a man in a bar and they were all mimicking the preacher. Right. You know, and, and you know, he did, because he, he, uh, he would jump around, he'd cry often. And so they thought that was hilarious. It was free entertainment. Sure. So this man gets up and says, I can do this better than you all. So he gets up, he's handed the the Bible, and uh, and um, it's a verse of scripture that says, "Repent and believe." So he just says, "Repent," and he can't speak. Wow, this is pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? One person can make a difference. George Whitfield stepped up to be the one, and we are a nation today because of people just like him. We saw the 1857 prayer revival, how many individual people stepped up and revival went through 50 nations. George Whitfield united our separate colonies into one single nation. He was an accidental revolutionary, helping us fight the injustices of things like the Stamp Act while he was in England. He would also go on to minister in Scotland on 11 separate trips. When the city of Glasgow had only 17,000 people there, he had over 30,000 people in his meetings. When Whitfield saw war would be inevitable between America and England, he stepped up and helped us fortify in practical ways. When men died in the Boston Massacre, the first skirmish of our Revolutionary War, Whitfield rode across all the colonies to get to and comfort every family of the dead. He didn't live long enough to see our nation fully birthed, uh, but our troops never forgot him. They would go to his gravesite and take a fragment of his clothing with them into battle. Like William Seymour of the Azusa Street Revival, George Whitfield had one working eye. People said he had one eye looking to bless them and one eye that saw God. Thank you for sharing in this update on George Whitfield, and we'll see you next time right here on Revival Radio TV. Do you wanna know more about revivals like I did? Listen, you have to dive deep and scour the internet and read books to get all the information you need, but right now, We've developed something just for you. It's Revival Radio TV. Here you can learn more about us, how to contact us, updates, but also learn about our timeline, a special feature you'll only find on Revival Radio TV where you can actually scroll through history and see what God did as He poured out the Holy Spirit on all the people.